Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, you guys want to fill in over here? Um, so the reason I've asked everybody to come here because we have an investigation going on that I'm very concerned about uh, the way we're kicking off our summer. You know, on Tuesday, shortly before midnight, right as the uh, calendar year hits the beginning of, of summer, we received a 911 call about a shooting on East Cayuga Street. It happened right in the area of 31st and Cayuga. When we arrived, we found a 14-year-old boy, Danico Thomas, laying in the street with a gunshot wound. He currently is in the hospital fighting for his life. Our detectives are still actively investigating to identify the suspect or the suspects who have fled the scene, possibly in a white vehicle. At this point, we're not aware of what the motivation is of this shooting. We don't have enough information. You know, and right now I'm asking for our community, a call to action, so to speak, to provide us with some information and bring this suspect or suspects to, to justice. We need the community's help to solve this crime and other senseless shootings that remain unsolved in the city of Tampa. We need to prevent future shootings. As you're keenly aware of, when we have this type of violence, at times it turns into retaliatory nature. And it's just not acceptable. It doesn't matter your economic background. It doesn't matter where you live. We cannot have gun violence in the streets of our nation, let alone in the city of Tampa. We work very hard as a police department to reduce crime. And this is not the way we want to start off the summer. You know, with me, I have Crime Watch coordinators Frankie Jones and Regina Virgil. State Attorney Andrew Warren is here and members of my staff. You know, we are very concerned that we cannot have our kids out there in the streets worried about gun crime. Now, this happened just shortly before midnight. And I have a feeling what will happen is that somebody's going to want to blame the victim and ask why he was out at midnight. And in my opinion, that is completely irrelevant. Something we need to do as a police department, police in general, the media and society, we have to stop blaming the victims. We cannot blame the victims. We need to stand up and say the violence is enough and we need to put an end to it. We need to start telling the police, telling law enforcement in general, who has guns, who has illegal guns. If they should not be legally possessing a gun, we need you to turn them in. We have to do something to stop the violence. And we can no longer just accept it and say, well, that's what happens when you live that lifestyle. Now, this 14-year-old boy was not a bad kid, OK? He was not a bad kid. He did have some challenges in his life. The concern is, is if he lives, what's the next step for him? And what's the next step for his friends? Is there going to be retaliation? Are, they, are, are he and his friends still in danger? And so that's what we have to take the hard look at. We have to have the awkward conversation to find out what's going on. You know, as chief of police, I stand in front of various members of the community and I brag about how crime is down. We discuss that. You know, 18% overall violent crime so far this year in the city of Tampa. 24% reduction in gun crime. This morning, I met with the family of this 14-year-old boy at TGH. Try explaining to them that gun crime is down right now. Numbers are one thing, but the victims, these are people who have names, they have faces, and they have families, and they have friends. And we need people to step forward with information to tell us what happened. And we need people to start telling us who possesses guns illegally and turning them in so we can prevent further violence throughout the summer and throughout the life of these young kids. Does anyone have any questions? It's your understanding that the weapon used was illegal? That, that whoever shot him should have had it? Or? Well, we don't know. But, uh, you know, you question why would they uh, run up and, and why would they shoot somebody in the middle of the night and flee? I, I, have, to, uh, I have to make a guess that it probably is an illegal gun and is probably not in self-defense. Do you know if he was the target or was he an innocent bystander in this? Well, he was the only one there. So we have to believe he was the target. What was he doing before the call happened? He was with friends playing video games. Outside? No, inside. Oh, that okay. address was his house? Or? No, we think he was headed home, but we don't know for sure. Any more on the suspect yet? Did you put out a... You know, unfortunately, that, you know, and that's part of the problem, 
is, you know, we have a white vehicle and that's all we know. And we're not aware of the motivation. It's just frustrating to me as a police officer and to our investigators that it's like, let's not wait for this person to die and let them become another statistic before we start saying enough is enough. And, and that is the, the big concern. And like I said, I, I stand here and I talk about how we reduce crime, but when you're a victim of crime, you don't want to hear about reductions and things like that. You know, I think the, the, the people in the neighborhood don't know, but I think his friends, his circle of friends, his, uh, the people like that, that he hangs out with, they're talking. He's 14 years old. Other teenagers in the neighborhood probably know. Uh, but when I meet with the family and their friends, they don't know, they don't have any information. And so I think it's a generational thing that is not sharing and coming forward. And at some point, we need people to stand up and, and like I said, we've got to know about illegal guns in advance prior to the actual acts of violence. And it turns into quite the cycle of violence where we've noticed that, that through history that if you become a victim of gun violence and you're roaming the streets, there's a good chance you may at some point end up conducting some other type of violence towards someone else. It's very frustrating. I feel for the investigators that are going through this. It makes it difficult to uh, bring these, these kids to justice that are out there doing it. And, you know, especially, you know, we don't know enough. Is this a neighborhood beef? Is he beefing with kids within the neighborhood? Is it from somebody from a different neighborhood? And it's just unacceptable for everyone now to stand up and go, yeah, that's what happens. That happens in certain parts of the city. That attitude has to stop. In, in certain pockets of the city, yes, and and people, uh, it, it's awkward for me as chief of police to stand there and talk about it. People don't like to have those conversations about gun violence. And like I said, I, I talk about how crime is down. I talk about how gun violence, the work that we have done, a 24% reduction so far for the city of Tampa just for this calendar year so far. But explain, try to sit down with that with this child's grandmother at TGH this morning as he had just got out of uh, surgery, his second surgery, and is facing a third. She really doesn't want to hear about our crime reduction right now. And I get it. I don't blame her. I don't like talking about it to her. And it, it's frustrating. It's frustrating for me. I think you guys can sense that, that um, you know, we have some phenomenal police officers. We have great people within the criminal justice system locally that work hard to prosecute these crimes. And when we have people out there who's not willing to step forward and give us information, it, it's, it's frustrating. You might have said this already, but what is his condition right now? He's in stable condition. Stable, but it, serious, critical? Yeah, he is, uh, it's, it's serious condition. He is, he's stable right now. He's had, he was in intensive care, and, um, you know, but it, he, he's had two surgeries already. What has he been able to tell you? We haven't been able to talk to him. I, I don't know. What about the traditional forms of uh, seeking help, uh, rewards, or anything like that? Going we haven't explored that yet. You know, that's still this is still fresh, um, but we're not willing to wait until he dies to, before we do this call to action. And that's why, you know, we we are working with our neighborhood watch people, our crime watch. Uh, we're going to have a large presence out in this neighborhood, knocking on doors, finding out what's going on. You know, you can expect that if you're out there. Uh, and, you know, there's a good chance you may get stopped and asked what's going on and see, you know, we're going to seek information. Yeah, are you know any other groups that are going to be there? What's that? Are you know any other groups that are going to be there? I've heard some of the people who are coming out and sort of filling up the neighborhood. You know, I don't know. We're putting the word out to the neighborhoods. Um, that's why I've asked the, the Crime Watch people to come here and join me today to show that this is a group effort. You know, I've learned a lot. I think the community learned a lot from the, from the incident in Southeast Seminole Heights that we cannot do this alone and that we need people to come outside. We need people to turn on their porch lights and tell us what's going on in their neighborhood. We need that type of spirit throughout the city to prevent this type of stuff. Uh, 
Uh, it looked like he was alone, and we believe he was at a friend's house prior to this. But it happened on the street. It happened on the street. So he was we, the yes, yes, it was outside in the street. Home. We think he was walking home. All right. We believe that he was headed home. He had spoke to his grandmother shortly beforehand, and we, and we believe he was headed home. No, I don't think so. So basically, he was over at friend's house playing video games. He left outside to walk home from the shop. Yep. Drive by shooting. We don't know. That's what I'm saying. We have very limited information, and it's fi I find it hard to believe that someone's not talking, that somebody doesn't know something. And that's what we're asking for, is more information of what happened. Do you believe the suspect or suspects were in a white car, but you don't know if they like, jumped out and went up to each other or they were so We don't know. We have very limited information, and that's what's frustrating over the whole thing. And we need people to come out and find out what's going on and share that information with us. If they're not comfortable talking to the police, they have the opportunity to speak with their crime watch people, um, tell their parents, and we will find a way to get the information from you. All they have to do is reach out to us. Was there any surveillance video in the area that you were able to collect? Not that we're able to find right now. Did we ask any of the would watch people at Lawyer Griffin's room? Or say, what? No. No, I, I, I don't think they're comfortable with that. Oh, okay. So. Alrighty, thank you.